Barnelli just finished her PhD. So congratulations, Barnelli. So um, that's, that's something to celebrate indeed. And you're, you're coming here all the way from India to give us this talk. So I hope we got it at a decent um, time. So it's not too late for you. Um, and as I understand it, you're going to be joining the University of Delaware as a postdoc soon. So congratulations on that too. So uh, maybe without further ado, I'll let you uh, begin your talk on the coherent radio mission as a unique probe for hot magnetic stars. So please go ahead whenever you're ready. Thanks. Yes, so I will share my screen now. Uh, you can all uh, see the screen, right? And uh, do you all see my screen? I do. Yes. Looks yep. good. Yeah. Okay. So, good morning, everyone. So, uh, I guess it's good. It's morning for everybody else. So, good morning, everyone. So, before I begin, uh, I thank you so much for giving me this opportunity to present my work in this platform. And let me confess at the very first uh, slide that I, at the last moment, I decided to reduce the content slightly than what was promised in the abstract because based on my past experience, I thought I should keep some time to accommodate technical issues, but I do, I really hope that I won't face any such issues this time. So, so to, the topic of this talk is coherent radio emission as a unique probe for magnetic massive stars. So I'll start with introducing magnetic early type star, which I, I suspect everybody is already very much familiar with. So these are stars of spectral type O, P or A, which have, which have large scale surface magnetic field. And it has been found that in many cases, in most of the cases, the field is often very close to being a dipole-like magnetic field and the dipole axis is often inclined to the stellar rotation axis. Because of the interaction of this large scale magnetic field with the stellar wind, a magnetosphere is formed around the star and the magnetosphere hosts a variety of electromagnetic phenomena which give rise to emission from X-ray to radio frequencies. So before I talk about the radio emission, let me first introduce a, a few terminologies often used by the radio astronomers working in this field, which are this inner, middle and outer magnetosphere. So this is a little bit artificial kind of labeling, but nevertheless, let me uh, explain those. So this is a very simplified description of the magnetosphere surrounding a hot magnetic star which has a very idealistic exosymmetric dipolar magnetic field. So this small circle here is the star and this vertical arrow represents the dipole axis. And these are the magnetic field lines surrounding the star. So the inner magnetosphere is the one where all the field lines remain closed. The magnetic field energy is larger than the wind kinetic energy. As a result of that, the stellar wind materials are forced to follow these field lines. And this is supposed to be the densest part of the stellar magnetosphere. And the uh, equatorial radius of the largest closed magnetic field loop is called the alpha radius. And the outer magnetosphere, as is evident from the name itself, it is the part of the stellar magnetosphere which is far away from the star, where now the wind is more strong, we need, we need stronger than the magnetic field. And as a result of that, the stellar wind distorts the magnetic field lines. Now the mass loss can happen freely. And in between the inner and the outer magnetosphere, there is a transition region, which has been given the name of middle magnetosphere. So I will be using these three terms uh, quite frequently in my talk. So how non-thermal radio emission is produced from hot magnetic stars? So this non-thermal radio emission is produced by stellar wind electrons that are accelerated because of magnetic reconnection that happens near the magnetic equator. This scenario was actually, it's, it has its origin in 1988 itself and it has modified slightly in, this is from 2004, from the Trisillo Ardo 2004 paper. But although I won't say anything in detail, but let me just mention, here that this scenario is going to change. So now the, the idea is that this scenario that which says that the radio emission, the non-thermal radio emission arises completely in the middle magnetosphere, which is the region outside the inner magnetosphere. So it seems that this scenario is appropriate only for the stars, which is, which is rotating very slowly. 
so but that i will not go into that it will uh, it's it's you can find you can find it you'll be able to find it in detail in in, in the upcoming paper lead, which will be led by matt and Schulz. and the emission mechanism using which is responsible for the non-thermal radio emission produced by this hot melting star is known to be the gyrosynchrotron emission and this has certain nice properties like this rotational modulation so here this is for a hot magnetic star this is a magnetic b star it the top panel shows its stellar disk averaged line of sight magnetic field as a function of rotational phase and you can see this nice sinusoidal like variation which is what is expected if the magnetic field is close to being dipolar and the dipole axis is not aligned with the rotation axis and the line of sight is also not aligned with the rotation axis and on the bottom panel this is the I think five gigahertz total intensity as a function of rotational phase. And once again, you can see this very nice rotational modulation. And the interesting thing is that this modulation correlates with that of this line of sight magnetic field. This non-thermal radio emission, this gyrosynchrotron emission was first discovered in the year 1987. And for a long time, this was thought to be the only form of non-thermal radio emission that is produced by solitary hot magnetic stars. So in binary, there could be synchrotron also because of minion collision. So the coherent radio emission, which is the, which is a, a main topic of this talk, this was discovered in the year 2000 from the magnetic late B star CU Virginis. So this discovery happened in the following way. Trigilo et al observed the star with a VLA at four frequencies, 1.5 gigahertz, 5 gigahertz then 8.4 until and the, and the 15 gigahertz so at their three highest frequencies of observation which are 5 8.4 and 15 gigahertz they saw nothing peculiar so this variation was very consistent with what is expected for gyrosynchrotron emission and the stokes v or circular polarization was also very low so this was nothing peculiar and all consistent with the, with the existing scenario of non thermal radio emission from these magnetic B stars. However, at their lowest frequency of observation, they saw something very peculiar. So you can see that this is Stokes V, circular polarization, as a function of rotational phase. And they found that at two narrow, over two narrow rotational phase windows, there are two very strong enhancement in flux density. And these are, you can already see from this plot, both are very highly circularly polarized. So here I have list of peculiarities. The first is that the observation of very strong enhancement in flux density that is confined to a narrow rotational phase window. Then interestingly, both these enhancements were observed near the rotational phase where the line of sight magnetic field was zero. And this rotational phase where the line of sight magnetic field is zero will be called magnetic null phases and sometimes magnetic nulls, just magnetic nulls. And also, I already mentioned that both are very highly circularly polarized, and it was found that the, it is approximately 100% circularly polarized. And finally, the brightness temperature was found to be quite high. So all these properties rule out an incoherent emission mechanism. So it was confirmed that some this is the result of some coherent emission mechanism. That left them with two possibilities. One is the plasma emission. The, and the other is the electron cyclotron major emission, in short, ECME. The problem with plasma emission is that it cannot explain the very high directivity. The fact that these enhancements were observed over an arrow rotational phase window, and then it was also confirmed that they were not just some transient, but they were also observed at every rotation cycle. So they are there are clearly some persistent enhancements. And because they were seen over narrow rotational phase windows, it implies directivity. And plasma emission cannot explain this property. It also cannot explain why such enhancement should be observed near the rotational phases where the line of sight magnetic field is zero. ECME, on the other hand, can explain all the observed properties. And as a result of that, naturally, this enhancements, this peculiar emission that was observed was attributed to ECME. So this slide will give some very brief description regarding it, this emission mechanism. Basically, we'll introduce some of its characteristic properties of ECME, which will also be important for the rest of my talk. So 
first of all, ECME is produced by the mildly, mildly relativistic electrons with an unstable electron distribution, provided the local plasma frequency is smaller than the local electron gyro frequency. So it is favored in regions with high magnetic field and low plasma density. Then the frequency of emission is proportional to the local electron gyro frequency. So that means it can directly give us an estimate of the magnetic field at the site of emission. One consequence of this property is that the since this ECME is intrinsically a very narrow bandwidth phenomena, so and the emission frequency is defined by this or governed by the magnetic field strain at the emission site. As a result of that, different frequencies are produced different at produced at different heights from the stellar surface. So the higher frequency will be produced closer to the star because there the magnetic field strain will be stronger and the lower frequency is produced farther away from the star. Also, in cases where the magnetic field is dipolar, which is the case in more, in, for most of these magnetic hot stars, the regions which corresponds to a constant emission frequency, they also correspond to the regions with constant magnetic field. And in case of a dipole-like magnetic field topology, such regions constitute ring-shaped regions, and these are called Orwell rings. This is a cartoon diagram showing four Orwell rings, which are which give rise to frequency given by these relations. B naught is the polar strand here, and you can see this constant factor decreases as we go farther away from the star. It's because uh, the frequent the local magnetic field strand decreases as we go farther away from the star. And this emission is directed tangential to this Orwell ring such that. It is almost the direction of emission is nearly perpendicular to the magnetic dipole axis. That is why they are observed near the magnetic nulls. And finally, this resulting emission is very highly circularly polarized. And the radiation that is produced at opposite magnetic hemispheres, they have opposite circular polarizations. So for these objects, we recently introduced a term main sequ sequence radio pulsimeter, in short MRP. I should mention here uh, that one fact is that uh, immediately after the discovery of these objects, or they were called actually the main sequence pulsar because the phenomena was very, very similar to the pulsar phenomena. It's just radio pulses, which are periodic, but these are the main sequence stars, but pulsars are death or neutron stars. So naturally they were called main sequence pulsar. The, the problem was caused because of the acronym, which is MSP which in the radio community is immediately associated with millisecond pulsar. So that's why we had to come up with a different name, which is the main sequence radio pulsimeter or MRP. So I'll be using this acronym also frequently in my subsequent slides. Now, let me show you the, the, the ECME signature in the most ideal case. This represents the, an eye. So basically, this is an observer. This represents the star. And this is the dipole axis. N means north, S means south magnetic pol polar regions. And on this bottom line, I will show you the, the light curve at that, or the expected ECM pulse that is that one expect to see at that particular rotational phase. So as I mentioned, the, the, the initial direction of emission is approximately perpendicular to the dipole axis, but because of refraction in the in the magnetosphere they were deflected that's why i have drawn this bent arrow so when the star is in this kind of a rotational phase then the observer will see the pulse that is coming from the south magnetic polar regions and at this rotational phase the net component of the magnetic field along the line of sight is slightly negative that's why i have that's what is shown here then after a slight gap, the pulse from the north polar region will be seen by the observer. And now the field has become positive. After a slightly longer gap, the pulse from the north polar regions will be again seen by the observer. And the field is, is still positive. And then finally, the pulse from the south polar region will be seen by the observer again. And now the field has become negative. And then this whole cycle will be repeated. So basically, when one rotation cycle, we expect to see two pairs of ECME pulses near each of these magnetic null phases. Each pair will have one pulse coming from the south magnetic polar regions and the other pulse coming from the north polar regions, north magnetic polar regions. 
and we can distinguish them because of the fact that they will have opposite circular polarizations. And this is a one slide summary of the of this current status of MRP discoveries. So this plot shows the, the brief history of MRP discoveries. The first star was discovered in the year 2000, then for nearly then for a, then until 2018, there wasn't a second confirmed MRP. So second confirmed MRP it was discovered by us using the GMRT, Giant Meteorite Radio Telescope. And then in 2019, there was a couple of more discoveries. And then finally in 2021, we, we discovered a large number of stars thanks to our uh, GMRT survey. So basically uh, out of the 15 MRPs that have been discovered so far, 11 were discovered by us using the GMRT that includes two confirmations. So and it's a little bit short, but uh, I hope it's okay. So based, so this discovery actually uh, allow us to infer a very important uh, or make a very important inference, which is that when it was found that for a long time, there was just one MRP and there, uh, there was a time when within a span of around two decades, only three MRPs are known. So that gave the that gave the impression that probably this phenomenon is extremely rare. However, by conducting a systematic survey using the, the rotation period data and magnetic field data from the optical surveys, we showed that, or we we are now of the opinion that it's not rare at all, but it is probably ubiquitous amongst the hot magnetic stars. But this talk is not, not about this, this, uh, this discovery, but this talk is about how one can use this emission to probe the stellar magnetosphere. And this idea actually that ECME could be a stellar probe is not new. Immediately after the, the discovery of this phenomena, it was realized that it could be a tracer of rotation period evolution. The principle is very simple. If the star is rotating with a constant rotation period, then we'll always see the pulse at the same rotational phases, irrespective of the epoch of observation. However, if this is not the case, then we'll, that will imply that the rotation period has changed. So for example, this is for the magnetic late B star HD 13280 for 687 megahertz data. These are 687 megahertz data. And here I am showing you one pair of ECME pulses. Uh, I mentioned that there are two pairs of ECME pulses for rotation cycle. Here I'm showing you only one such pair. The RCB means right circular polarization data and LCB means left circular polarization data. And this, the upper panels corresponds to data that were acquired in the year 2019. And the bottom panel corresponds to data that were acquired in the year 2016. And you can see that the peaks are, peaks are, are they are not aligned, which suggests that the, that the star has probably undergone rotation period evolution. And this principle was used by Trisilo at 2008 to predict the rotation period evolution of CU virginis. And later, similar uh, rotation period evolution was diagnosed uh, for two other MRPs in 2019 and in 20, 2020. ECME has also been used to constrain the plasma density at the site of emission. This principle is slightly complex. So it is based on the, on the fact that the magnetoionic mode of ECME, whether it will be extraordinary mode emission or X mode emission, or it will be the ordinary mode emission or O mode, o mode emission, it is determined by the ratio between the local plasma frequency to the local electron gyro frequency. If this ratio is larger than a value say around 0.3, then the, the, it will be the, the mode of emission will be the ordinary mode. And if this ratio is smaller than this value, then it will be the extraordinary mode. So if we can, identify the magnetoionic mode from the observation, we can actually put a constraint on the plasma frequency because the electron gyro frequency is directly related to the, the frequency of emission. So we already have some idea about omega B from the frequency of emission. And then we can put a constraint on omega B. Now, how does one identify the magnetoionic mode from observation? So this cartoon diagram on the right shows or illustrate that fact. For the, so the idea is that the difference between the two magnetoionic mode in terms of what we observe is in the 
sequence of arrival of the oppositely circularly polarized pulses. For example, consider this magnetic null, which is labeled as null one. So null one is the magnetic null where this line of sight magnetic field changes from negative to positive. And null two is the magnetic null where the line of sight magnetic field changes from positive to negative. So in case of X mode, we expect to see the LCB or left circularly polarized pulse first, followed by the right circularly polarized pulse near null one and vice versa. Whereas the, in case of the ordinary mode, it is just the opposite. This whole scenario, it is based on the idea that near null one, where the line of sight magnetic field is changing from negative to positive, the first pulse that we see, it arises at the south magnetic polar regions and the second pulse that we see arises at the north magnetic polar regions and vice versa. This scenario in turn depends on the assumption that once the ECM is produced, it gets deflected because of refraction in this manner. They go away from each other. The pulse that is produced in the northern magnetic hemisphere, it will go or it will get refracted upward and the pulse that is produced in the southern magnetic hemisphere, it will get refracted downward. So if this picture is valid, then this way of identifying magnetoionic mode of emission is valid. So I'll come to that towards my towards the end of my talk again. But what we found is that ECME encodes many more information about the star than just these two. And this is this in, this information is encoded in the frequency dependence of ECME properties. So Trigilla adult 2011 first noticed that the different frequencies, different frequencies of ECME, they do not arrive uh, at, at, the, or at the observer at the same time. So there is there a slight lag between pulses at two different frequencies. And this was attributed to the refraction in the stellar magnetosphere. So they proposed a very simple but useful model for explaining such uh, observation. By the way, note the frequency. These are, these are around 1.5 and 1.8 gigahertz. So it's not very widely separated frequencies. So this, this model I'm calling as a single refraction model. The reason will be clear very soon. So this is a cartoon diagram to illustrate the basic features of this model. This is the inner magnetosphere, which is uh, just to remind you is the region where the, all the magnetic field lines are closed. The magnetic field energy dominates over the stellar wind kinetic energy. And here I am showing you the ECME radiation at two frequencies, nu1 and nu2. Nu1 is higher than nu2 because it is produced closer to the star. So this model says that after it is produced, when it enters the inner magnetosphere, it suffers a refraction at the boundary between the middle and the inner magnetosphere, which makes it deviate in this manner. The more important part of this model is that it says that any subsequent refraction that happens that or that might happen because of density gradient within the inner magnetosphere or at the time of exiting the inner magnetosphere can be neglected. So this is the only refraction that matters. So that's why I'm calling it as a single refraction model. And in this case, it can be easily shown that the lower frequency will suffer a higher deviation than the higher frequency. And how much they will be deviated, this, this determines what will be the gap that will be observed between the oppositely circularly polarized pulses, pulses at near a given magnetic null. I'm, I'm hoping that you can see my cursor. Can someone please confirm that, that, yeah, that whether you can see my cursor? Yeah, we can. Okay, yeah, thanks. So yeah, so larger, if the, if the gap is larger, this or the, the amount of deflection is larger, then this gap between this oppositely circularly polarized pulses will be larger. So the prediction of this model is that when the frequency will increase, then the gap between these oppositely circularly polarized pulses will reduce because of the fact that the higher frequency deviates less than the lower frequency. And this is the only kind of change that one would expect to happen as a function of frequency based on a single refraction model. So if this scenario is valid, then it is always possible to uniquely determine the magnetoionic mode provided one have the information regarding the 
the circular polarization of the pulses and the line of sight magnetic field. So this is quite an important model, hence, because this, this way of identifying the magnetoionic mode, this in turn is used for constraining the plasma density at the emission sites. However, what we realized is that there wasn't any observation to validate this scenario. Remember that this, is, this was proposed based on observation at 1.4 and 1.8 gigahertz, but ECME was observed over a much larger frequency range than just that. So there wasn't any observation over wide frequency range for any of the MRPs. So we decided to overcome that limitation by conducting ultra wideband observation of MRPs. So we chose three targets. One is uh, CU Virginis, which was the first discovered MRP, then HD13880 and HD142990. These were later discovered from our survey. And our frequency range was 300 to 800 megahertz, which was obtained using the upgraded Zion meter F radio telescope, and one to four gigahertz, which was using the Carl Dijansky Very Large Array or VLA. And here is just two uh, photographs of the two nice telescope. This is the UGMRT on the left. It has 30 antennas, each of which of diameter uh, 45 meter diameter. So it's indeed a giant. Each of the antenna is actually a giant antenna and it was spread as in Y-shaped array with a central core. And the uh, GMRT was, is operated by, by the National Center for Radio Astrophysics, which is in Pune, which is the institute where I am currently a postdoc. And the VLA, I'm, I'm, I'm sure everybody is familiar with, it is, it's located at Socorro, New Mexico. It has 27 antennas, 27 steerable antennas, so, so that the distance separation between the antennas can be changed, which is a very, unique feature of the radio of this radio telescope. Its antenna has a diameter of 25 meter and it is spread as a Y-shaped array. And from this ultra wideband observation, we found that there are significant departure from this expected behavior. Expected behavior means the behavior that is predicted from a single refraction model. So I'll give just a couple of examples. First is the pulse arrival sequence as a function of frequencies. This is for the star HD 142990. The red markers corresponds to the right circularly polarized uh, pulse, and blue markers correspond to left circularly polarized pulse. Null one corresponds to the magnetic nulls, where the line of sight magnetic field changes from negative to positive, and null two correspond to the magnetic null, where it is changing from positive to negative. So, just I'd like to draw your attention to the pulses that are observed near null one. So here you can see the already see that the pulse heights are different, but you can clearly see that the blue or the LCP pulse arrives ahead of the RCP pulse. And as the frequency increases, the, the gap, the separation between the two reduces. So up till now it is still more or less consistent with a single refraction model scenario, which says that as the frequency increases, the gap between this oppositely circularly polarized pulse should reduce. However, what I found surprising is that when you go to even higher frequencies, it seems like that the gap has increased again. In fact, if you com just compare this panel and this panel, you can see that now the sequence has reversed. Here, the LCP arrives first, followed by the RCP, but here, the RCP arrived first, followed by the LCP. So instead of coming closer and closer to each other, then staying there, they, it's kind of seems like they come close to each other and kind of over to each other in opposite direction, leading to this increase in separation between these oppositely circularly polarized pulses. So this is something that cannot be explained at all from this single refraction model. In addition, you can also see that the pulses near the two magnetic magnetic nulls, they have little similarities. They, they are very, very different. Their pulse shapes, their strength, everything is very different for the two magnetic nulls. So again, this is, none of this feature is explained in the single refraction model scenario. Then it's the, there is this quantity, which are the cutoff frequencies. So although ECME is a broad, effectively a broadband phenomena, but it still has some, some frequencies below or above, which if not, we cannot, do not see the, the phenomena. So for hot magnetic stars, one curious thing is that the upper cutoff frequency has always been found to be much less than the maximum electron gyro frequency that is possible. 
So it seems like due to some, some unknown reason, the ECME cannot be produced below a certain height from the stellar surface. So it was produced that this happens because of the presence of very high density plasma close to the stellar surface, uh, which inhibits the production of ECME. What we observe in our, in our wideband observation is that this upper cutoff frequency seems to have a dependence on stellar orientation. What I mean by that? So here I have shown you the peak flux density spectra. So I have plotted the peak ECME flux density as a function of frequency between two to four gigahertz. So there are, these are, there are four panels because in one cycle there are uh, four pulses, two pairs, each pair have two pulses. These are the LCB pulse near null one and null two. Null one is this one, null two is this one. And similarly, the corresponding RCB pulses are, or spectra for the RCB pulses are shown here. So you can already see that if, even though this is the same LCB pulse which is produced in the southern magnetic hemisphere, the cutoffs are very different. For this one, it's around three gigahertz, but for this one, it is below two gigahertz. So it seems like the upper cutoff depends on the relative orientation of the star with respect to the observer. This is also inconsistent with a single refraction model and uh, existing ideas regarding what should what gives rise to the upper cutoff in this hot star's magnetosphere. And finally, let's talk about the separation between the pulses. Once again, to remind you, the separation between the two pulses, it's, it's a consequence or it's believed to be a consequence of purely uh, refraction that happens in the inner magnetosphere. What we found is that the separation between the pulses are again dependent on the stellar orientation. For example, consider this third panel here at the same around one gigahertz frequency. You can see here the gap between this oppositely circularly polarized pulse is much less than the gap that is observed near this magnetic null. So this separation also seems to be dependent on what, magne or what magnetic null we are observing. So this already tells us that the single refraction model is inadequate. And the fact that we observe orientation dependence suggests that these observed discrepancies are not due to some intrinsic properties that the, or, or, some, or is not something intrinsic to the site of emission. But rather, it could be due to propagation effects within the inner magnetosphere, which is ignored in the single refraction scenario. So we decided to examine whether the propagation effect or refraction that can occur within the inner magnetosphere can play an important role in the observed frequency dependence of ECME properties. But, for, but to do that, we have to consider a realistic model for plasma distribution in the inner magnetosphere. And we decided to use the rigidly rotating magnetosphere model, in short, the RRM model, which was proposed by Townsend and Nowaki in 2005. So this is a semi-analytical model that give relative circumstellar matter distribution around hot magnetic, rapidly rotating hot magnetic stars under the assumptions that plasma can move only along the magnetic field lines and the magnetic field lines are fixed in the star's rotating frame of reference. So I'm going a little bit quick because I'm, I'm, I'm pretty much sure that everyone is familiar with the RM model. So the, R, one, the important point here is that the RM model predicts very sharp variation in density inside the inner magnetosphere. So for example, it predicts that there could be a, an overdense disk lying at the magnetic equator in cases where the rotation and magnetic axis are aligned. In that case, it is actually not relevant for the ECME because ECME, as I've said already, it was found that in all cases, ECME is produced a little bit above the stellar surface. So if it is entirely confined at the magnetic equator, then the radiation or the ECME will not encounter this overdense region at all. And then we are fine with this, we should be fine with a single refraction model. But the problem is that all but one of the known MRPs, they have very, very high obliquity or very high misalignment between the magnetic and rotation axis. The three MRPs that we have considered in our wideband study, all of them have obliquities higher than 70 degrees. In fact, one of them has an obliquity close to 90 degrees. In which case, the RM model predicts that this overdense region 
does not remain at the magnetic equator for all magnetic azimuth, but its orientation becomes a function of the magnetic azimuth. For example, it can be here in this manner, in which case the radiation that is produced say, in the south magnetic hemisphere will face or will encounter this, this high density region and which is likely to cause significant refra refraction in this uh, or deflection from its original direction of emission. So based on these ideas, we, we realized that it is important to consider refraction inside the inner manthosphere. But because this was not thought to be an important effect, there wasn't any framework available to do this test of how, how important is such effect. So we decided to develop such a framework, which uh, can calculate ray path inside the inner manthosphere for any kind of density distribution, assuming a dipolar magnetic field. And this has been implemented in Python. So the first case that we considered is the one where there is this overdense disk-like region, but that is entirely confined to this magnetic equator. And as I mentioned already, or as expected, in this case, we do not see any difference in the, in the simulated light curves from what is predicted from a single refraction model. So here, the result is shown. The blue pulses or blue uh, lines and curves, it indicates the radiation that is produced in the south magnetic polar regions. And the red is used to indicate pulses that is produced in the north magnetic polar regions. And this represents the line of set magnetic field variation. And once again, L1 and L2 are the two magnetic nulls uh, defined in this manner. So you can see that in this case, as we go to higher frequencies, the only difference that we'll see is in the, in the gap between these oppositely circularly polarized pulses. So it reduces as you go to higher and higher frequencies. However, when you consider in a density distribution, which is not asymmetrically symmetric, and this is inspired from the RRM model, where we consider a, a density distribution, which has a disk-like over density, but the orientation of the disk is a function of the magnetic azimuth, which we are calling as phi b. In that case, we found that the light curves could be very, very different than the predictions of the single refraction model. So you can already, I hope, see the difference. For example, there is no LCP below, sorry, this is not LCP. The blue here does not mean LCP, but blue here means pulse that is produced at south magnetic polar regions. So you can see below two gigahertz, there is no pulse observable from the south polar regions. And this, this, this offsets are also very different. Offsets of the arrival phases of the pulses from these magnetic nulls are also different. And one very important difference is the, is the sequence of arrival of, the, of these oppositely circularly polarized pulses. For example, I would like to draw your attention to this two gigahertz light curve. So near null one, you can see that the pulse from the south polar regions arrive first, followed by the pulse from the north polar regions. So blue first followed by red. However, what we found here is that in this case, the red comes first followed by the blue. So there is, an re there is a reversal in the sequence of arrival of the pulses. So it has quite a, a very important significance so, so remember how that I mentioned how one identifies the magnetoionic mode. So it is under the assumption that the radiation gets refracted in this manner in all cases. The radi radiation that is produced in the north magnetic polar region will always get refracted upward. And the radiation that is produced in the south magnetic polar region will always get refracted downward. And the, under this assumption, this is what one expects. And this, is, this has been used to constrain the plasma density at the site of emission. But our simulation suggests that the radiation can not just get refracted in this manner, but can they, they can also get refracted in this manner, which leads to this reversal or parent reversal in the pulse arrival sequence. In this case, this picture no longer remains uh, valid. So what we learned from the exercise is that not considering propagation effects properly, might lead to a wrong density estimate in a stellar magnetosphere. So it is very important that we start considering this, this refraction that can happen because of the density gradient within the inner magnetosphere. 
So the important point here is that we realize that a large number of ECME properties like the like the, the cutoffs, the sequence of arrival of the pulses, the number of pulses that is observed will at a given frequency, all of them are sensitive to plasma density distribution in the inner magnetosphere. This gives us the idea that ECME can act as a probe for the 3D plasma density distribution surrounding these hot magnetic stars. And I would like to give one uh, demonstration of, of that. So this here, this is this is a preliminary exercise. We are uh, we haven't done it uh, in a in a what I, I should I should say maybe in a proper way or in a in a robust manner. But these are the observation of our wide frequency range for the star HD 15880. These are the this these two columns corresponds to data nearly two magnetic nulls. So left column corresponds to data which is which is uh, near this null one, and the right column corresponds to data, which is near this null two. And red corresponds to RCP and blue corresponds to LCP. So we consider the RCP pulses observed from the star HD 12880 over around 400 megahertz to two gigahertz. And the LCP pulse that was observed from the star were the similar frequency range. And we decided to examine how the lag between two frequencies, the lag means the difference in pulse arrival time at the two frequencies, but in units of rotational phase. So it's effectively time divided by rotation period. So we decided to examine how this lag varies as a function of frequency. And these lags were obtained by cross correlating these, these pulse profiles. And before I show you the observed results, let me explain what we expect. So under the single refraction model scenario, in which case we totally ignore the refraction within the inner magnetosphere, we expect that over a small range of frequencies, this lag will be proportional to this quantity lambda one square minus lambda two square, where lambda one and lambda two corresponds to the wavelength of the two frequencies under consideration, and M is a proportionality constant. M is higher if the average density in the inner magnetosphere is higher and vice versa. And this is what we observed. So here, this is the RCP lag. This is the absolute value of the lag as a function of this quantity lambda one square minus lambda two square. And this is the same plot for the LCP pulses. And one thing you can already see that this, this best fit line, which is the, which represents this linear, this linear relation, the M value of M is not same for the two cases. This is, higher for the RCP and slightly lower for LCP. So already saying that the two magnetic hemispheres are not identical in terms of uh, magnetospheric plasma distribution. Not just, uh, not, not just the slope of the line, but the way that the relation deviates from this linear relation are also different for the two pulses or two polarizations. The deviation is clearly higher for the RCP pulses than the LCP pulses. So this suggests that the two magnetic hemispheres have different types of plasma density distribution. So we decided to investigate it uh, a little bit deeper. So to quanti basically qualitatively understand when such difference occurs or in what aspect the two magneto magnetic hemispheres are different, we decided to use our 3D framework, but we considered an asymmetrically symmetric plasma density distribution where there is an overdense disk like region lying at the magnetic equator. And we examine the effect of two quantities. One is the absolute density scaling, and the other is the width of this overdense disk, which I am calling a sigma naught, and the absolute number density scaling is NP naught. And this is what we observed. So this is again lag versus this quantity lambda one square minus lambda two square. It seems that the effect of increasing this absolute density scaling is just to increase the y-axis, the value of this lag. However, the effect of increasing sigma naught is that it makes the re relation between lag and this quantity lambda one square minus lambda two square more and more nonlinear. So our observations shows that the RCP relation is less linear than the LCP relation. So that suggests that the RCP pulse experiences this disk more than the LCP pulses. 
something that is possible for an inclined disk-like region. It already says that this overdense region cannot lie at the magnetic equator. So the significance of this simple exercise is that this star doesn't have, this is a magnetic lead B star and it doesn't have detectable H alpha emission, which is often used to constrain the, the plasma density distribution surrounding these stars. So as a result of that, no constraint is yet available regarding its circumstellar plasma distribution to the best of my knowledge. So does this, the, this qualitative constraint that we obtain from this exercise of ECME lag as a function of frequencies provides us the first such constraint regarding the 3D plasma density distribution of the star HT 12880. In fact, even in stars for which there is detectable H alpha emission, we can one can use the coherent radio emission in conjunction with H alpha to, for example, to break the degeneracy between two models. But to achieve that goal, we'll require a much better simulation. For example, our 3D framework is still idealistic in certain cases. For example, it still assumes a perfectly ideal dipolar magnetic field. So if we if we want to make realistic estimate of quantities, we have to also improve our simulation, something that we do want to do plan to do in the future. But this is not the end of the story regarding ECME acting as stellar probe. According to me, a more exciting aspect of ECME is, is the discovery of the fact that ECME has the ability to act as a torch for the time. So what I mean by that, I'll explain in a, in a few slides. For that, I'd like to explain something, uh, the variability exhibited by ECME pulses. So it was noticed that if you observe the same star at two epochs, then the ECME pulse height could be different. For example, Trisilo et al. 2011 noted that the ECME pulses observed from the star C. virginis when they, they were observed the star uh, the gap of uh, one week, and they found that the pulse heights are different. And this was attributed to instability at the emission sites. So these are thought to be the local instabilities. So that happens at a, say, at a given orbital ring or over a narrow range of orbital rings. But when you observe or perform this wide band observation, we notice something very interesting, which is that whenever such enhancement or reduction in pulse rate happens, it does not happen over just a small range of frequency, but it happens over a wide range of frequencies. So if you consider applying the same uh, idea that this happens because of instability at the emission site, this will imply that there has to be instability simultaneously over along a large portion of the magnetic field line. So there has to be some kind of correlated instability, which makes the it makes these pulses at different frequency to get enhanced at the same or approximately at the same time. More interestingly, what we found that the whenever the pulse from the north magnetic polar regions is enhanced. The pulse from the south polar regions also does that. So there is kind of a correlated change in pulse height. So that this Stokes V or circular polarization fraction profile remains almost unchanged uh, or is almost independent of the epoch of observation. That will imply that these instabilities are not just correlated along a given magnetic field line, but they are also correlated across the two magnetic hemispheres. This stream, this seems extremely unlikely if these are if these are indeed some local instabilities. So we then find a new perspective, which is that, so first of all, this nature of this variability exhibited by EC pulses is inconsistent with the scenario of the stochastic instabilities happening at the emission sites only, which was proposed uh, originally. So we asked the question of whether this instability may happen at a region that can affect both hemispheres equally. And the region in the magnetosphere that satisfy this property is the magnetic equator. Now, what could create an instability at the magnetic equator that will affect ECME? And till now, the best candidate is centrifugal breakout that happens in hot magnetic stars with centrifugal magnetosphere. So all these MRPs that have been discovered so far, all of them have centrifugal magnetosphere. The centrifugal magnetosphere means the magnetosphere in which case the capillary radius, which is the distance at which the 
the, the centrifugal force due to uh, force balances gravity. And Alvin radius, I have already mentioned. So in case of centrifugal magnetosphere, the Alvin radius is larger than the capillary, capillary radius and plasma then can accumulate between the region RK and RA, between the region uh, uh, of capillary radius and Alvin radius. So, but because this magnetosphere has only a certain capacity to hold this material so along, an important question has been, what happens when that threshold is crossed, the, threshold, the, the capacity of the magnetosphere to hold material is crossed? And the answer was that this, when, such, when the threshold is crossed, then this magnetosphere will burst open and the plasma will escape. And this will happen as a one single large scale event. And this was called centrifugal breakout. But the problem was that there wasn't any direct evidence of such violent event. And this issue was resolved only recently with a proposition that the CBOs are, are not large scale events, but rather they are small scale events that are there at almost all times, but they are distributed along the magnetic azimuths. H alpha and other photometry or UV lines, they all are produced at large parts of the stellar magnetosphere, and hence significant spatial averaging is involved, and hence they cannot retain any signature of the CBO, the small scale CBO events. ECME, on the other hand, has a unique property of being highly directed. As a result of that, it can retain information that are related to local changes. And that is what is illustrated in this cartoon diagram made by me. So hopefully, once we succeed in fully characterizing this phenomena, we will be able to use this emission, this coherent radio emission, as a unique probe to see these small scale events or CBO events. So with that uh, hopeful note, I'd like to end my talk. Here is the summary. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thanks, Barnelli. That was a great talk. And I appreciated all your background information. Um, um, it was very, very interesting and well explained. So I guess we can turn it forward to ask the audience if people have questions. Um, I'm happy if you raise your hand or if you want to just go ahead and uh, unmute and ask a question, that's fine too. Yeah, hi, Stan. Oh, you got two people that have raised their hands. Um, Stan Whisper. Let me know how you go, let me know how you go first and I'll, I'll follow. Okay. Go ahead, Anna Yi. Hi, hello. Hi. Hi, Vernelli. Thank you very much for your very interesting talk. It was very clear for, for yeah. at least for me, I'm not, I'm not in, in the subject and it was very, very nice. Um, you mentioned well, I, this, this very last um, thing you, you explained was very exciting and I imagine it can have um, lots of different um, interesting results. Um, so um, you mentioned that you need these large scale magnetic fields. So far, what are the intensities that you need in order to this to to have this, um, I, um, I don't remember how, how you call them, this uh, out, not outflows, the, um, well, the, the material that is escaping when, when you have these releases of mass. Is it possible for this to happen when you have small um, amplitude, I would say, magnetic fields, large scale, but very small amplitudes? Would you expect to have something like that or do you need something stronger? Uh, actually, I'm sorry, could you repeat the question? Uh, Sorry, yes. My question is, what is the um, the amplitude of the magnetic fields that you need to have this um, this last effects? I I'm sorry if I missed some points. My my connection is not very good here. No, no, it's but fine. the amplitude of the magnetic fields. Do you have like a lower limit where you can have this this happening, or um, or can you have this occurring for small amplitude, large scale but small amplitude magnetic fields? So uh, are you asking uh, what what is the magnetic field uh, somewhere here to affect ECME or uh, is that your question? 
Um, yes, um, yes, some, I think that that's my question. Okay, okay. So I'm not sure I'll be able to satis give a satisfactory answer. So currently we really do not, uh, so we haven't exactly mapped it to this, to this uh, big breakout events. So this idea has emerged very recently that this correlated changes could be related to CBO because there is no other candidate that we know of. But till now, there has we haven't met, we haven't come up with any quantitative mapping between the two events. So yeah, so at this moment, I, I'm sorry, I I won't be able to give a, give a more quantitative answer. Okay, thank you. Yes, again, um, I agree that uh, Bernali was a very nice talk, and thank you very much for explaining it so well. Um, it, in response to Nahi's uh, question, the kind of magnetic fields you need for this phenomena are kilogauss, a border kilogauss. <clears throat> and uh, in the paper by um, uh, Matt Schultz and myself, we, we go into that, what the level of magnetic fields. But small scale magnetic fields will not be able to confine material and, and make, um, you, you need, you need a very large amplitude magnetic fields. But uh, getting to the, um, uh, substance of your talk, I guess uh, one issue here is uh, how the magnetic ma ma magnetic field, uh, what's the global structure of the structure? I'm sorry, my dog is barking at me. Yeah, she wants to go out. Um, but um, come here. Sorry about that. Anyway, uh, I, I guess what it comes down to is that you have to remember that the magnetic field is not just, is not just, uh, 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 in a, in a circumstellar disk that it actually has three-dimensional structure in azimuth. And so I guess one of the questions I have is, is the emission itself also, is it, is it um, in this polar cap, this ECME emission, is it um, independent of the, uh, how is it depend on that kind of uh, physics? Is it just dependent on the magnetic field or does the plasma density also play an important role in where the e ECME is emitted. Because the question you have, you have this beautiful uh, argument that you're making that you can use, um, you can use the ECME emission as a torch to uh, illuminate the tiny. The question is, is that torch likely to be all on a ring around the polar regions or is it, is it likely to be in specific uh, azimuths? Is the EC emission itself also dependent on the density of the magnetosphere at, at different regions? Okay, so I I guess the question is how is ECME dependent on on quantities other than the magnetic field? Yes. Yeah. So ECME is it, this this growth the intensity is indeed dependent on the plasma density. So the there are some simulations work done. Uh, purely of the theoretical uh, work that shows that the intensity seems to be seems to be less when the plasma density is higher so as i said it is the, it will be stronger if the plasma density is smaller and uh, there seems to be some dependence on the on the, on the, uh, the in the an energy of the in or the emitting electrons itself so this the characteristic that or i would say the non thermal electron temperature also so yeah, so it's, it's not just a magnetic field that, that defines this uh, ECME amplitude, the plasma density, then this, uh, this non-thermal electron temperature, they all play, all also this, how that, it's, it's the current idea is that this is because of the loss cone distribution that happens because of magnetic mirroring in the, in the converging magnetic field lines. So how, how, how much is the thickness of that loss cone that also, if, if it is thickness is say the gradient is, I think sharper, then it is uh, the, the growth rate is higher. So I do not remember exactly, but these are the quantities, the width of this loss cone that also play a role in, in defining the, the, the net intensity of this emission. Okay, I, thank you. Thank you for that response. I guess that that's a very interesting question because obviously what you will see depend on both the the, the torch and the clumps that are the tiny structures that you're trying to illuminate. If you're illuminating it from a, a broad ring versus a, a local region, that'll make a big difference in what kind of variability. But it sounds like a great thing to try to model, and I'm looking forward to talking to you some more about that. Thank you. 
yeah, yeah. Anyway, thank you again for the very, very nice talk. Thanks. Okay, we've 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 run out the full hour. Has anybody got another last minute burning question for Banelli? Oh, Greg Wade has got a raise his hand. Go ahead, Greg. Thanks, Carol. Um, very nice talk, Bernali. Thank you very much. Um, my question is, um, given that the data that uh, you've been using to diagnose this phenomenon have gone from very basic uh, observations at one or two frequencies uh, five years ago to very sophisticated, um, the uh, the wideband observations that you showed us today. Uh, where do you see this project going observationally in the future? What what kinds of new observations or improved observations do you need to move forward? Yeah. So uh, one thing is, I think you all uh, anyway. So we, what I want to say that you probably know some of it. So of course we are continuing our survey with a much more emphasis on, on finding a, a non-MRP because now the idea is that probably almost all of them produce ACME. So it's will be really interesting to find out a star, hot magnetic stars that does not produce ACME to understand what is so special, if there is anything special about this MRP. And the other thing in this aspect of using ACME as a stellar probe is uh, what I currently, the thing is that one, uh, very few for very a few of the stars we know the spectra, but what, even for the and in fact all the wideband spectra were provide were actually reported by us, but we also do not know whether the spectral shapes are are same or not. So if this idea of of ECM this instead ECM being an intrinsically stable phenomena, but but being a partner because of the instability at the, at the same magnetic equator, then in that case, we'd expect that the spectral shapes or the spectral index or, or whatever it is it, is, it is, it should be independent of the epoch of observation. So this has not been examined for any of these stars, whether the, the spectral shapes are, are same or, or, or constant or not. So that is something that I really want to do to, to find out whether the, the slope of the spectra or spe the spectral shape is something that is characteristic of this emission or not. And uh, in a simulation aspect, I plan to do a better realistic kind of simulation. Eventually, I'd like to be able to do some, make some quantitative estimate based on, so it's the ultimate goal is to, is to do a kind of MC-like thing to get a or to estimate the, the, the real physical quantities by matching the simulation versus observation. So these are kind of future projects that is in my mind, but that might uh, evolve after this, yeah. Thanks very much, very good ideas. Thanks, Barnelli. Okay, so we have run out of time here. Barnelli, thank you again for a very, interesting, well-explained um, talk. And um, we will have our um, next talk a month from now on the, and actually at the same time, because our speaker for next month is, um, we'll be giving the talk from China, Lucian Wang. So I hope that some of you can join us again. And yes, thanks again, Barnelli, great talk. Very interesting. Bye, Bye everybody.